Welcome to our first of many lecture videos together. At the start of each of our videos going through introductory astronomy, we'll have a slide like this which tells us where we are in our textbook. We're following OpenStax Astronomy 2nd Edition and the two to three learning outcomes that we want to be able to um, show that we can do by the end of our work with this material. So that includes watching the lecture videos, taking notes, looking back over the notes, discussing with your peers or with your instructor, um, until you feel confident being able to do those things. Just watching the videos probably isn't going to be enough, um, but it is going to be the right start. So let's get started. Now first, what I'd like us to recognize um, is that astronomy is a field of science, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about what science really is. Uh, a lot of folks um, decide for themselves that they're not cut out for science, or that science is only for a particular type of person, uh, and I'd really like to change our perception of that right here at the beginning of the semester. There's a lot of different ways that we can define science. Um, one way of defining it is um, the fact that in elementary school, we might be introduced to the scientific method, where we have an idea about the world and we call that a hypothesis. Now that term hypothesis is one that's going to come back, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. When we build a testable idea or model about observations that we make about the world around us, that's a hypothesis where we say, you know what, I think this is what's going on and I want to keep my eye out for more evidence to support that or not. We could also think about science as a frame of mind. Um, in, a, in a book called Think Again by Adam Grant, there are four different frames of mind or ways of thinking um, that are presented, and science is one of them. And I'm going to read a quote um, from that book. So, being a scientist is not just a profession. It's a frame of mind, a mode of thinking that differs from preaching, prosecuting, and politicking. We move into scientist mode when we're searching for the truth. We run experiments to test hypotheses and discover knowledge. Now, I want to focus on this fact that science is really about the process of getting new knowledge rather than this warehouse of knowledge um, itself. I want us to come away from this course recognizing that we're building skills rather than focusing on what we need to memorize for the next day. And then another way of... Um, defining what science is, is a way of knowing. And one of the really important things that I want to make sure that we understand right here at the beginning of the semester is that science is just one way of knowing. There are a lot of really important um, ways of perceiving the world and thinking about the world, and science is a tool that you can add to your toolkit, um, and it doesn't have to be the only accepted valid way of interacting with the world and thinking about it. So relevant to that last point, um, I've added a um, poem here by Walt Whitman um, that I have had conversations with a colleague before about. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that you pause the video so that you can read the poem at your own pace. And then um, we'll go ahead and continue after that. Now I do hope you pose... Uh, paused the video, um, there's going to be a lot of times in our lecture videos where I'm going to ask you to pause. So this is a chance to recognize that we might want to know where that button is um, so that we can think about a particular question I might pose at the pace that we need um, for our, our full kind of reflection of it. The reason I like this poem is because it really distinguishes between a lot of people's perception of what a science lecture should look like and what I want us to actually get out of this course. I want us to come away from this course with a sense of wonder about the night sky and a sense of reverence for our small place in a really vast universe. Uh, so the second half of this poem is really what I want us to get away from a science course, uh, whereas the first one is probably what you had in mind when you signed up for this course you knew you had to take. Um, even if you were interested in the um, content, a lot of people can be a little apprehensive about taking a science course, and I hope um, that over the course of this semester I can change your mind at least a little bit. Let's continue. Now, one thing I want to note is that um, this course is um, a Grand Rapids Community College class. Um, it satisfies several course learning objectives. There's a lot of material that I put together um, that goes along with these lecture videos. This is just one part of the class, but it is the part that um, anyone on um, online is going to be able to find eventually. Uh, I'm going to make these videos openly licensed. 
Um, but the course is also helping us build critical thinking skills, intellectual curiosity, and problem solving. So those are the general education learning outcomes that this course is also helpful for. And something that I do want us to have in mind is my biggest goal is that you come away with a better sense of how to think about a situation and use a finite set of um, known uh, ideas to apply to a brand new situation you might be presented with. Um, that we're not trying to memorize anything in this class, but rather learn how to apply our knowledge. All right, so this is one of the many times where I do want you to pause the video when I ask you to. So one of the things that we're going to be seeing throughout these slides are pause and think questions. Many of them will be multiple choice so that you've got a finite set of options to consider but some of them will be open-ended also. So I wanna present the way that these questions work um, when it's very low stakes. This is us kind of building our understanding of how we're gonna be interacting together throughout these recorded videos. So the first question that I'm presenting you with has to do with this word hypothesis that we um, mentioned in the previous um, two slides ago. So how many observational or experimental tests does it take to prove a hypothesis false? Pause the video so you can think as long as you'd like and have one of those five answers in mind um, when you unpause. All right, so one of the really important ideas about astronomy and about science in general is that if we have a hypothesis and we take in new information that shows that that hypothesis does not fit our observations, we have to um, get rid of the hypothesis or fix it um, to better uh, describe the situation that we're seeing. So the answer to this one would be um, one really good experimental test, or two if you're not quite sure that your experiment worked the way you think it did. So um, option two here, because we do want to recognize that it's meant to be easy to prove a bad idea wrong. Let's say that we live on an island that has a whole bunch of sheep on it and all of the sheep on our island have black wool. Our hypothesis might be that all sheep everywhere have black wool. All we would need to do is see for ourselves one sheep with white wool and we would have to change our hypothesis. And we might be able to change it pretty simply. We might be able to say most sheep have black wool, but then we would have a new experiment that has to target that hypothesis. We'd have to find a whole bunch of sheep to be able to say whether we are on the right track or not. All right, so a similar question, but it is not the same question. Pause the video so you can think about this one for as long as you'd like. But how many observational or experimental tests does it take to prove a hypothesis true? Now here is the true nature of science that I really want us to record in our notes and to think about and to keep in mind all semester. We cannot prove a scientific hypothesis 100% true. And we shouldn't be trying to do that in science. There always has to be this possibility that everything that we've seen so far isn't the full picture. So the correct answer for question B on this slide is five, uh, option five, an infinite number of tests. So let's say that we've started to go all around the world and, and look at a bunch of sheep fields and our hypothesis has become most sheep have white wool. And we recognize that maybe our island is actually kind of cool that it's got mostly black um, sheep. For us to be able to actually prove that hypothesis true, we would have to find every single sheep on every single planet in the infinite universe. And we just can't do that. We don't have the time, we don't have the resources, and it's simply not possible to visit all possible sheep everywhere. But once we've seen enough sheep, we're pretty sure about it. Um, and there is an opportunity for us to be able to convey to the scientific community that we are really confident in our hypothesis and everything that we have seen um, so far has supported that. And that's to use the word theory once we have made it that far. So not all of our slides are gonna be wordy, but this is a really, really important one and one of our learning outcomes for this, um, for this video. So science uses the term theory to distinguish the models and ideas that are fully accepted by the scientific community. 
These are the ones that have gotten so much evidence from observations and experiments, and all of that evidence has been um, in support, has been showing that we, that we haven't proved anything false yet. And it's worth recognizing that scientists are constantly trying to prove each other wrong. They're constantly trying to prove themselves wrong um, so that they don't publish an incorrect idea. And they're trying to um, prove other people wrong so that they can have this big exciting splash um, in a published paper. So when we see theory um, next to something in science, so the theory of gravity, the theory of evolution, the theory of climate change, these are ideas that have stood the test of time and all of the scientific evidence supports them. Now, once we start to get into these models and theories um, in this class and beyond, a lot of the key ideas behind them might be able to be um, represented mathematically, so as an equation. When we see an equation in this class, I don't want us to shut down and I don't want us to, um, to ignore it. That equation is a way for us to describe the relationship between different quantities, and it's going to allow us to understand where the numbers that we learn about come from. Now, on the topic of numbers, we need to recognize that anything that we do in this class is going to, um, that has numbers involved, is going to need to be paired with a unit. Numbers should always come with some context for what that number means. So, here's a couple of examples. When we talk about a measurement or a value of something, we want to make sure we have a number to describe the measurement and a unit to give it context. So, here's some examples. My cat Penelope is 11 years old. 11 is the number, years is the unit. She weighs 15 pounds. 15 is the number and pounds is the unit. And yesterday she chased three spring toys. Three is the number and spring toys, although it might not be a standard scientific unit, is the unit. So without units, some of these make sense, but some of them don't. So for example, my cat Penel Penelope is 11. That actually sounds like what we would say in everyday life. However, if you just met me and I talked about how I had cats at home and young kittens, there would still be ambiguity because you wouldn't necessarily know whether Penelope um, is a cat, 11 years old, or a kitten, 11 months old. She weighs 15. Now for that one, we could make a really solid guess at what um, unit, because we know that weighing um, has a finite set of options, but um, it's still not 100% clear what unit that would be. 15 kilograms would be way too big for a cat, so 15 pounds at least makes sense there. But then for any of you who have any um, pets at home, yesterday she chased three. That could be anything. That could be three bugs. That could be three um, spring toys. That could be three rolly balls. Um, anything. And we would have no idea because cats can get up to, cats can get up to anything. So, we always want to put the units down. Here's another thought experiment for us. So take a moment um, to read the prompt, pause the video for as long as you need to kind of picture what I'm asking you to picture, uh, and then unpause when you're ready to talk about it. Alright, so you had to decide what unit was missing um, from this statement and come up with a cube um, of that size. There's no wrong answer if I haven't specified the unit, so then you might have had um, a cube sitting on top of your pet cat that might have been eight uh, centimeters across, a gentleman cube dressed up all fancy where maybe it's uh, eight inches across, um, but we could have lots of different units, and in astronomy there are some really big units um, that eight, eight AU, astronomical units we're going to learn about, would be out past the planet Jupiter. So I want us to recognize that we need to be aware of what units are trying to tell us with numbers. Then the last big thing um, to understand about numbers themselves are that when we talk about numbers in astronomy, we're going to be talking about some really gigantic numbers, and when we talk about electrons in chapter 5, some really, really tiny numbers too. We need to understand scientific notation, um, and although that is something that I'm hoping that we come into this class already having heard about, I want to work with any student of mine um, who doesn't feel confident with scientific notation so that we can be prepared to use it um, in any context in this course. 
It's a way of writing numbers to save time in the same way that we use words to represent large numbers to save time when speaking. So instead of saying one zero 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 zero, we would say one trillion, and it would be silly for someone to um, to say it out the way I did the first time. But that word trillion is a way for us to, in words, talk about that number um, in a quicker way. And to write it out, um, if we were doing a calculation or if we were looking up um, the value of something, we would also not want to have to write out all of those zeros. And so we would use scientific notation, where 10 to the 12 means we have a 1 and 12 zeros attached to it. So um, there is a website I have linked here for um, those of you in my classes to be able to explore on your own and feel more confident. Um, and then there's a great supplemental video um, that kind of goes through all of the different size scales um, that we might see here in astronomy. All right. So I'm going to leave us here with this um, last slide for this video. Um, and I'm excited that you're here on this journey with me. So we talked about what science is and what it isn't, um, and I want to make sure that you understand my goals uh, as we continue on this journey together. I really like this quote from Albert Einstein, education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. I really try to stand by that goal, and I want us to recognize that in this class, my goal is that you don't um, learn by memorizing, um, that when we have quizzes or we have um, big tests, anything that I ask you to do as an assessment, you will be able to reference your notes and or the textbook, um, and I'll have all of that information in the syllabus, but it's never meant to be, did you memorize the right thing? Because that's not a good way to um, enforce this idea that science is a way of knowing um, and a frame of mind if all we're doing is looking up things um, or memorizing things that we could look up otherwise. So I'm excited to be on this journey with you, um, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks for watching.